If we look at the reason why a patellar tendon gets pathology in the first place, we often blame this on too much store and release loading. The tendon is subject to too much tensile stress. But there is a line of thought out there that the patellar tendon is also compressed against the patella bone, and this could be leading to the pathology. I talked about this in my podcast with Peter Maliers. There's this thing called compression when it comes to tendinopathy, and it's, you know, it's, it's when you've got an insertional tendon problem and you get the insertion compressing into the bone partly. Now that happens pretty much all around the body with tendinopathy, but uh, there's a, the sort of thinking around the knees that it happens more so around the quadriceps and it happens more so around the distal patella tendon, not so much the proximal patella tendon, uh, but that's not, I don't think that's very accurate. I think you still get compression at the proximal patella tendon. The studies that show or the studies that people quote for saying there's no compression here are not very convincing. So tendons all around the body are subject to tensile stress and compressive stress, but for some reason they say the patellar tendon does not get compressive stress. So let's look into why that is the case. In one of the biggest studies on compressive stress in tendinopathy, they listed off a bunch of tendons. If we look at the Achilles tendon, it gets compressed against the superior calcaneus when you go into ankle dorsiflexion. If we look at the upper hamstrings, they get compressed against the ischial tuberosity as you go into hip flexion. And if we look at the quadriceps tendon, it gets compressed in deep knee flexion against the femoral condyle. And if you look at this list of all the tendons that get compressive loads, they do not mention the patellar tendon. If we look at this study, relationship between compressive loading and ECM changes in tendons, it's more of the same for the patellar tendon. They say that tendinopathy is not just the result of overload, we also have to consider compressive loads, and that the combination of compressive and tensile overload can induce tendon pathology. They go on to say compression is not responsible for all tendinopathies as some lack a nearby bony prominence, such as the proximal insertion of the patellar tendon. So why the confusion with the patellar tendon? Some people say there is compression, some people say there's not. There was another study that attempted to clear this up. This study, patellar tendinosis as an adaptive process, a new hypothesis, they looked at the proximal posterior region of the patellar tendon, which is the area they proposed would get the compression. So as the knee is bending to about 60 degrees of knee flexion, you get this compressive load on the backside of the patellar tendon right underneath the kneecap because it's getting compressed against the patella. And because pathology and pain do not have a clear link, they concluded that rehab is not necessarily about healing the area of degeneration, but it is about improving the load tolerance of the healthy area of the patellar tendon to handle the increased demand of tensile load. If compression is a thing at the patellar tendon, how is this going to change rehab? If we talk about isometrics, isotonic, storm release activities. If you're in the isometrics, this may mean you start out in a more extended position, allow the tendon time to adapt, and over time you get to the more flex position of around 60 degrees, which is more compression on the patellar tendon. If you're talking about a Spanish squat, maybe you start up a little bit higher, and over the sessions, over the weeks, you get down to a deeper position. This is going to be more, get you used to compression, and it's going to adapt the patellar tendon better. If we're talking about a single leg sissy squat, Maybe you start up a little bit higher and you get deeper over time. You want the tendon to get used to compression, but you don't want the isometrics to cause more pain. So you have to feel it out for yourself. If we move to isotonics and you're doing something like a Bulgarian split squat, this could mean keeping the shin pretty vertical, which is going to be less compression on the patellar tendon. Start out with this. Over time, you can go to a closer stance where the knee is pushing a little bit more forward, a little bit more compression on the patellar tendon, and it's allowing you to adapt to the increased compression slowly. If we go to store and release, it's more of the same. Maybe you start out with minimal knee bend to do less compression on the patellar tendon, and over time you get to the deeper range, which is more compression. If we're talking about something like a seated box jump, maybe you start with a very high box to minimize compression on the patellar tendon. Over time, you get to the deeper box. You want the patellar tendon to get used to compression because that's what's going to happen when you get back to sport. If you're doing a standing jump, same thing, a minimal knee bend at first, then get deeper over time. This is probably the best way to get the patellar tendon used to compression if compression is a problem.